lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here finally again with Liberty Larry. Woohoo! I'm back. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> We're back, baby. I'm back. <laughs> back and better than ever. <laughs> so welcome back to the uh, the studio, <laughs> such as it is. Hey, it's good enough. Get well, the job done. I, were you one of my few downloads during your absence? I listened to all the episodes, so oh. I'm assuming I was a listener. Good, <laughs> good, good. And I thought you did well. I thought you represented the podcast well on your own. It's difficult to do these type things by yourself. Like you really got to have. It's got to be more of a conversation. Yeah, it's more fun when it's a conversation. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I did the same thing that a lot of people that I've talked to that listen do. Where I try to like talk back to you yeah. <laughs> as you're going along because I'm used to talking back to you. Yeah. Well, now's your chance, man. What do you got to say? So, oh, all kinds of stuff, man. Well, let's hear. Oh, it. Oh, well, maybe I don't know. Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> I should have made notes. Yeah. I should have made notes that I could have brought in and then like graded you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would been nice. That would have been fun. Yeah. Um. Well. Uh. Okay, so this is our plan. We know we've missed some time here, and and you guys haven't gotten the contents that the the content that we would like to get out to you. And there's plenty to catch up on, but it's going to have to wait just a couple more days. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to do a short one today, and maybe a longer one Friday. Yeah, that's the perhaps. plan. Um, and try and catch up with the news on Friday. Um, yeah, because there's a God, there's well, there's always so much going on now. But, yeah. I mean, um. You know, a little sneak peek. Uh, one, you know, a couple of things that I was hoping to, to get the opportunity to talk about. Um, and of course, some of this was things that I wanted to talk about before, but I thought that it would be better um, to As have a you here. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I I wanted to talk about uh, New York after they've shut everything down and in, in their reopening and Cuomo's little speech about how we're going to reopen better than before and that he was bringing in all these experts to help them with various things um, like uh, bringing Bill Gates for education and Mike Bloomberg to create a human contact tracking system. And I tell you, man, that if that's stuff. not scary, I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, remember these are the these are the um, the the Democrats, the people that you know claim that they're there for your you know that are supposed the, to be more liberty minded, right? Like um, yeah. as far as civil liberties and so forth are concerned, uh, and are of course anti fascist. Um, <laughs> yeah, as as they literally yeah. promote fascism. Yeah, like literally. Yeah. Like I mean, that's what that is. Exactly. <laughs> Let's get this private organization to take government funds and administer a portion of the government. Okay. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, apparently the um, the push to privatization includes Cuomo, not just the Republicans. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're both basically the same at this point. Both yeah, there's sides. not a lot of difference. I mean, there's yeah, there's more similarities than there are differences. Yeah, luckily, uh, we can offer an alternative. We can. So this uh, past weekend, we had the Libertarian Convention, or the first portion of it. Um, the uh, the Libertarian Convention, like the full thing, was scheduled for this past weekend in Austin, but a couple of weeks ago, the hotel that was hosting the convention said, yeah, no, you're out. Um, <laughs> we can't have a gathering that large. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's going to be at least a thousand people there from all across the country. Um, although, actually, it'd probably be more like you know, 2,000 people or so. Uh, the, the conventions oh, yeah. draw in more than just the delegates, of course. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, the... Uh, Result was that we had to do some plan being real fast, and yeah. um, which and we from what I understand was chaos. <laughs> well, it was no, I wouldn't call it chaos. Yeah. I mean, maybe the the planning and like trying to get it together was, but yeah. the actual event wasn't really. Well, um, yeah, I mean that's kind of what more I was getting at, trying to decide what to do. Yeah, what from at least from the outside looking in, because like I say, uh, I wasn't really involved at all. You were way more involved. Yeah, but I wasn't really involved in that board. All all I got was like informal surveys. Uh, would you still want to do an in person convention? Um, how about an online convention? Maybe some kind of hybrid of the two. And so you know, I was in favor of the hybrid, all things considered, because um, well, there's there's deadlines involved uh, in a lot of states, and certainly in this one. 
Um, there is a deadline involved in getting in enough signatures to have the presidential candidates listed on the ballot for Alabama. Yeah. Um, they extended the deadline apparently this week. Uh, it was supposed to be August 13th and now it's August 20th. So we get a whole extra <laughs> week. <laughs> nice. Um, as a, as a response to the, uh, COVID shutdown that lasted two months. Yeah. So you get a you get a whole week to make up for those two months. I tell you, collecting um, signatures for that's going to be tough too, man. No, it's not. It's going to be so much easier than like collecting signatures for my campaign well, because it doesn't matter what district they're in. It just yeah. matters that they're an Alabama voter. I mean, there's a lot that's more true, signatures but, needed, but we but got it, people all over the state doing this. But yeah, you know, agreed with as far as that goes. But just trying to go door to door to people right now, can you imagine? Oh like, uh, yeah, that's well, people are were already standoffish about opening the door, and now it's going to be like more so. Yeah, and I can have a fight with another guy that's uh, on a homeowners association about whether I'm soliciting or not. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm like, no, I'm petitioning, not soliciting. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> I'm not selling anything. Yep. Um, liberty. I'm selling liberty. <laughs> yeah, and it's free. And it's free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, it'll it'll be yeah. I agree. I mean, I want to I want to get out there and no, collect I signatures because I actually I feel like that's a perishable <laughs> skill. Yeah. I had gotten fairly decent at it for yeah. a while. I won't say I was good at it, but I had gotten decent with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just making the case right. Like uh, we're not asking for your endorsement. We're just asking to be listed on the ballot like yeah. everybody else. That's option. all we want. Um, but uh, as far as the convention's concerned, it was now split into two parts um, because of those uh, deadline issues. Um, because when you're submitting the uh, request to have the presidential and vice presidential libertarian candidates on the ballot in Alabama, you have to name them. Yeah. And uh, in order to name them, you have to have selected them. <laughs> <laughs> have to know who they are. <laughs> and uh, so um, with that in mind... Um, we did an online portion of the convention this past weekend uh, with the sole purpose of selecting our presidential and vice presidential candidates. And then we'll have an in-person convention at the beginning of July to do all the other business. Yeah. All right. um, and uh, no, it was interesting. I thought it was kind of fun. Um, there were uh, six presidential candidates that got enough nomination tokens to, to be um to get to speak and so forth. And we're the participate in a forum yeah. type deal. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> it's the libertarian party. So all write-ins are welcome. Um, we also on every single ballot, and this is something that should be available on presidential ballots. I think anyway, um, there's the, uh, none of the above option. Nice. And if none of the above gets 50% or more of the, uh, the vote, you get to throw out all the existing candidates and start, start over. Start fresh. But the people that were on the ballot can't be again. Nice. <laughs> that's the that's way so to I'm do So I'm going to assume that didn't happen this time. No, no. Um, I would like to, I would actually like to know how often that has actually <laughs> happened, but... Have to dig in the archives. I mean, there were, sometime. there were NOTA votes, though. Yeah. There were NOTA votes on every ballot. Nice. Um... But uh, anyway, um, of the six, uh, the uh, it ended up coming down to the candidate that our presidential candidate is Dr. Joe Jorgensen. She's a um, psychology professor lecturer at Clemson. Yeah. Um, she was on the vice presidential ticket, or she was the vice presidential candidate um, with Harry Brown in '96. Now, uh, I didn't vote in '96, but <laughs> me either. And actually, that would have been the first presidential. Um, election that I would have been eligible to vote in. Well, That's interesting. I voted for Harry Brown, but when he ran in 2001? 2000, yeah. Or 2000? Yeah. I was old enough to vote then and yeah. voted for him when um he ran that cycle. Yep. I voted for him in 2000 also. That was the first president yeah. that I voted for. Yeah. And I've only voted Libertarian as far as president. I've never voted Democrat or Republican. I've always voted Libertarian. Um, I'm pretty sure the same is true for me. I think that I haven't voted libertarian every time, but when I haven't voted libertarian, I haven't voted for any, anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I can understand that. <clears throat> um, and this time is interesting. I'm, I'm sure I will be compelled by her and end up casting my vote for her, mm -hmm. but I'm, I am on the fence about it. Yeah. No, I think she's a good candidate. I, I think my, so of the six people that made it, she was fifth on my list. Yeah. Um, but I I promote the activist candidates. Yeah. Uh. So I I liked all the people that 
a lot of libertarians say we can't put that in front of the American people and ask them to vote for that person. Well, and people like uh, Vermin Supreme and, <laughs> yeah. um, and Adam Kokesh and like I, I actually well, like those guys. Yeah, I was a big fan of Kokesh, and the big pro- the only problem I really had with Kokesh is that there were so many people that that looked at his activism as a problem. Yeah, um, I don't understand. I think that's a problem with them, not with him. I, I agree, but at the same time, we need a candidate that will bring the party together. Mm-hmm. And and she may be it. We'll wait and see, because there's no way to know yet. Mm-hmm. But there has been, I've seen a lot of pushback online against her, and not so much even against her, but against her running mate. Oh, well, he's the activist. He is the activist, exactly. Um, I, that's interesting. I, uh, I, the thing that I was kind of amazed at when I was watching the voting happen um, this weekend was that apparently like she was about, uh, about 20% of the delegates first choice. Really? Okay. Yeah. And so was Hornberger and, um, and John Mons was also up there at like 15% or something on the first ballot. I tell you, and, and just a quick, quick mention as far and as Vermin Mons. Supreme. Yeah, I knew I knew, knew Vermin Supreme was pretty up there too. Mm-hmm. But Mons really just won over everybody. Yeah, like, I like him a I lot. I mean, he was somebody that came in, I think, for most people pretty well unknown. And mm-hmm. for him to make it as far, to pull that much crowd says a lot about him. Yeah. Um, I, I wish he had been the VP. I really think that could have been a strong ticket. Yeah. Um, I, I supported Cohen on the VP and, and, but I do understand your point. We'll come back yeah. to the VP stuff later. Okay. I'll, I'll, That's fine. Um, I, uh, yeah, but Mons was ahead of Jorgensen for me for the presidential ticket too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, um, I can understand why. Yeah. Uh, I, I liked him a lot. Every time I heard him speak, I liked him more. Yeah. Uh, he was, he's sharp witted. Mm-hmm. Um, he certainly understands the message. Uh, he, he doesn't seem like somebody that's going to take any crap. I've, I felt like he was somebody who could deal with an antagonistic media. Yeah. And if there's one thing that we learned in 2016 is that we that. need a candidate that yeah. can deal with antagonistic media. And Gary Johnson was not that guy. Exactly. Not that guy. <laughs> to um, the core, not that guy. <laughs> um, I think Jorgensen's smart enough to handle it too. I hope so. Um, I, you know, I, I think part of the reason, well, I, well, like I said, we'll talk about the VP later. But the, here's the thing that I thought was really interesting is that after every ballot, when somebody was eliminated, yeah. um, and just for those of you that don't know, the way it works on the Libertarian, uh, the balloting for uh, presidential candidates is that um, you turn in nomination tokens. People that receive a certain number of tokens get listed um, as you know primary candidates. But like I said, you can vote for anybody. Yeah. Um, and then uh, after each round of voting, any candidates that didn't receive at least 5% of the delegate vote uh, are eliminated. And if everybody received more than 5%, then the lowest, the person that received the smallest percentage is, is eliminated. Removed, yeah. um, and then it's the first candidate to get 50 plus one, 50% plus one of the vote is the nominee. Doesn't matter what ballot. So if somebody yeah. gets 51% of the vote on the first ballot, that's who it is. They're the candidate. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, she got about a fifth of the vote. So did Jacob Hornberger, who uh, was the other front runner. Um, but the thing that was interesting is that she was like everybody's second choice, it seemed. Because yeah. every time somebody was eliminated, a huge majority of the votes for that person jumped to her. Jumped to her. Yeah. And I was really surprised to see that. Um, but she made a real run. And, uh, you know, Hornberger only picked up another 60 or 70 votes. During the, you know, as the elimination phases went on. Um, but she obviously picked up hundreds of more votes. Yeah. She picked up many more votes every round. She went from like 22% to like 31% to like 38% to, you and know, 50%. And everybody that was, that was on Hornberger just kind of was already there and not leaving pretty yeah. much. And, yeah. Yeah. and she was gaining while he was just kind of staying the same. Yeah. 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 Even when people like Kokesh got eliminated. Yeah, I that, would have expected his votes to go to Hornberger or Vermin Supreme, and yeah. I don't think that that's really what happened. No, it, it didn't sound that way from what I heard. So. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't remember specifically, and I wasn't taking notes on that, but yeah. but her percentage jumped every time somebody was eliminated, and nobody else has really jumped like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I'm con- she's certainly a better candidate than Gary Johnson. Yeah. Uh, this is this is the best ticket we've had since I've been involved with the party. Yeah. Um, well, what I hope to find, what I hope we end up seeing is a balance where, where you've got the top of the ticket, 
is is like principled, you know, has has a strong message mm-hmm. and is a serious candidate. And then the VP is can kind of represent the more activist part of the party, you know, yeah. and bring the two together. So far from what I've seen, it, it hasn't really played out that way, but the, it's yeah. early and, yeah. and it, it could, but we'll just kind of have to wait and see. Well, I, this is my concern about her. Um, and the thing that, that stood out to me in her debates and so forth um, is that she she talks about herself as being principled and a pragmatist. Yeah. Uh, pragmatist is kind of a dirty word to me in the Libertarian Party, uh, and we can talk about that a little bit more later after we do a quick little convention review. In yeah. fact, I want to talk about that a little bit more later. But yeah. um, anyway, uh, this is like... I'm not going to say compromise is a dirty word, but there's two different kinds of compromise, and we'll see where she falls. Yeah. Um, there's the kind of compromise that says, well... I won't go as far as I want, but I'll go as far as you'll let me. Yeah. And that's a compromise to some degree to not take it to, to the extreme. To not take it to as far as it should yeah. go. Yeah. And not be all or nothing about it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I get my way or, or nothing's going to happen. Well, okay. I'll just take as much as you'll give me. Yeah. And I am absolutely on board with this kind of compromise. I mean, that's what the Democrats do anyway. That's yeah. how they. That's how they always win. That's true. Is that, well, the Republicans do that too, but not as effectively. I not think. like the Democrats do. Yeah. Um, there. Then there's the kind of compromise that says, "Well, you get something that you want, and I get something that I want." And I'm not on board with that kind of compromise yeah. because that's a step forward and a step back, and you haven't gained any ground that way. Okay. Um. So we'll see what kind of compromiser she is. Actually, we yeah. probably won't. But yeah. Um. I, I hope but, she's the former, not the latter. Well. I, I just hope I'm hoping because I wasn't I didn't she ha, was at the the debate in Alabama mm-hmm. and I just didn't walk away I mean she didn't really do anything for me I mean yeah. she wasn't exciting she wasn't I mean I, she just she was just kind of there as far as I was concerned mm-hmm. um, and so I'm hoping that with the big stage that she can pull people into the party because yeah. that's really what this is about I mean at the end of the day I would love to see the libertarian win but it's just probably not in the cards but can she mm-hmm. bring people into the party because that's what this is about yeah is is growing the party and making it bigger um, because somebody mm-hmm. like Ron Paul, done that like he ran as a republican but he brought all kinds of people into the party that wouldn't be here without him yeah um, that's true well he brought him into the liberty movement to the movement but that's good enough for me because at the right. end of the day that's what it's about is changing minds mm-hmm. and um i hope she's able to do that yeah um, well she she certainly put together a broad coalition among libertarians she has broad appeal apparently among libertarians yeah. and hopefully she'll have broad appeal among non-libertarians as well I hope so, because that's that's really the goal here is to to you know make the party bigger. Yeah, <laughs> like, and we we end up with uh, some interesting slogans like uh, "Our Joe is better than your Joe." Yeah, <laughs> um, or uh, uh, "Vote Libertarian," the only candidate that hasn't been accused of sexual assault. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> or, <laughs> Um, who knows? Yeah. We'll, we'll see. There's, how there's a I lot had a really good one the other day. And I can't remember. There's what it was. a lot to work with there. We'll <laughs> yeah. just say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that brings us to the VP candidate, I think. Um, so John Mons, after he was, uh, eliminated from the presidential, um, race, uh, moved over to VP and actually, uh, Dr. Jorgensen and vote, um, supported him, um, for the VP. She, she wasn't real strong in her preference, which is just as well. Because here's the other thing about the Libertarian Party that most of you maybe don't realize, yeah. is that we vote on the president and the vice president. The yeah. president doesn't pick their running mate in yeah. the Libertarian Party. It's assigned to them. <laughs> um, and in fact, it's constitutionally, it's yeah. not supposed to work like that for the nation either. In yeah. fact, the person that comes in second in the presidential race is supposed to be the vice president. And that's still in the Constitution. That has not been changed. <laughs> been but changed. we don't do it that way anymore. Yeah. So every election that we've had since FDR has been an unconstitutional election, actually. <laughs> so this is all a fraud anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, but <laughs> regardless of all that, uh, we um, so John Mons moved over to the presidential ticket uh, or vice presidential ticket. Um, Dr. Jorgensen uh, um, uh, supported him um, for that, but not not real strongly. She didn't say, this is my guy. She was yeah. like, you know, I, I have a good relationship with him and I would like to see him, but I would be happy with any of these candidates, you know. And that's probably the best 
tact for her to take because that kind of gives you some wiggle room regardless who it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. as I understand it, some people are upset that she didn't give a stronger endorsement to him because they feel because it ended up being so close that they because feel like he would have won. Have pushed him over the edge. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would have been interesting if we'd ended up. I would have been happy with John Mons too, although I supported Spike Cohen. I thought that. Um, I, I hope that John Mons sticks around. And I hope he's our presidential candidate sometime in the future. I do too. I think um, that guy's got a lot going for him. I do too. Uh, I think that he makes a better presidential candidate than a vice presidential candidate. Yeah. Um, I, I actually supported Spike uh, partly because of his activism, um, but partly because of his media savvy. Yeah. I, I think that that's the important aspect of of the vice presidential candidate is like, it's just that communicating, communicating, yeah. communicating, communicating. And I, I think that he's a very effective communicator. Um, and I wanted that radical bit on the ticket too. Well, I, I think you need that. I think you need that. You need that to balance out the ticket, you mm-hmm. know, because you need, I mean, and honestly you need both. I mean, both those wings of the, of the party are important. Mm-hmm. And, and it, to me, that's the way to do it is to have one of each to kind of balance it out and, and, you know, make that push. Yeah. That being said, I hope he does wear a, a shirt and tie. Well, um, he's already been given crap online because I guess after he had won or whatever, he did mm-hmm. a, um, a video or whatever with yeah. no shirt. So oh, with no yeah. Shirt? And it's, and it's go- the picture of him going around shirtless in front of the zoom or whatever is like viral and oh. the, uh, in the libertarian circles right now. So, I mean, I saw one and there's with mixed him like, messages about it, yeah. but some I people, saw one with him like laying out on the beach or something oh, like yeah. in the water or whatever, but yeah. And he didn't have a shirt on then, but he's at the beach in the water. Yeah. Well, no, he, they, <laughs> apparently he did something, um, some kind of video or something after mm-hmm. all of this where he didn't have a shirt on, but now like everybody, all the libertarians that support him mm-hmm. are like doing their profile pic of them with no shirt on. Oh, so, <laughs> I mean, there is a following for it. Like yeah. people are, people are getting behind him, but well, a lot of people aren't too. So. <laughs> I hope that when he's meeting with people, he has a shirt. And tie on. <laughs> Once he I, starts I do doing the, media spots. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but that's, you know, that's something that I think that he could be good at. And, yeah. uh, in fact, I expect him to be, he, he's yeah. a part owner of a media company. He understands media. He understands outreach. So I he should that understand is... that he needs to wear a shirt every now and then. Yeah. Anti. <laughs> Anti. Okay. Yes. You're running for vice president, man. You need to look professional. Okay. <laughs> My opinion. We'll I, see. I could be wrong. Um, you know, when I went out and was trying to collect sign, just trying to collect signatures out in front of the thing, I wore a suit. You did, I remember. Yeah, <laughs> that like, was. That I was, was running for the... board of education, not vice president of the United <laughs> States. I think that it's although board of education you... seems like a suit, more of a suit um, position than anything else. To than you. vice president of the uh, United maybe States, maybe not more than that, but only marginally. <laughs> okay. Just, just saying. Well, um, so that does bring up the question and this is something like I debated with people through chat unfortunately so it's hard to debate um but all weekend really about the importance of the the radical side of the party yeah. um the importance of not so here's my position on it besides that there's plenty of historical evidence that would suggest that you're better off with the taking the radical position anyway. Um, because Ron Paul was clearly more radical than Gary Johnson and Ron Paul brought a whole lot more people into the movement than Gary Johnson did. Yeah. And Gary Johnson may have gotten more votes than any other libertarian last year, but he didn't bring this, people into the party. This he got votes, it's, not me, members. To me, this isn't about votes. It's mm-hmm. about changing minds. Yeah. I mean, I could care less about the vote count because if we're not going to win, which, I mean, obviously I want us to, but, I mean, reality sinks in. If we're not going to win this election, it needs to be about something. Yeah. And to me, that's changing people's minds. Yeah. And well, and the, the people that are about getting votes, it's about ballot access as much as anything for them. They're looking for access. And that's important. Access, access, access. And it's, I agree, it's important. But to me, the, the change starts culturally. Yeah. Like you got to get people to believe in liberty, you know, um, and then they'll vote for you. Yeah. Well, and it's it's an important topic right now because mm-hmm. with everything else going on with the COVID and whatnot, like liberty is important and people are talking about it. And yeah. there's people on all sides of it. People that, that started on one side have switched to the other because mm-hmm. of fear and things like that. I mean, it's an important topic and having the right person presenting that message for our party is important, particularly in this election. Yeah. 
So this is the most important election ever. Is that well, what you're it, telling it, me? It always <laughs> is, but but our topic is going to be out there the most. Yeah, and that's that's really more my point is that that what people are going to be talking about whether or not we ha- the states have the right to shut people in like they've been doing. Mm-hmm. Like that's going to be a subject. Yeah, and it I mean that's never been talked about before because it hadn't been a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, at what point do you consider it incarceration? Exactly. All right. Uh, well, this is what I, I keep saying is that you have to, you have to get people to realize, and I, I'm, and I'm not going to say you have to convince people. I'm going to, I'm going to say you have to get people to realize that they can solve their problems better than government can. Yeah. Um, and, and for some people, like that's not a far leap. Like that for, for a lot of people, it's like, well, obviously that's the truth. But for a whole lot of people, it's not. They've, they've just, we've grown up and lived in the society where government has controlled everything for so long. It's like, well, I mean, you can't have these things without government. Like what people be lost, like people be rioting in the streets. Yeah. It made me think of this quote. I had to pull it up real quick. Um, which means out of the notebook in my pocket. Yeah. Why don't you pull it out? (laughs) Um, it's a Benjamin constant quote and I wanted to make sure that I got it right. right. Um, he said, every time governments offer to do our business for us, they do it worse than we would. And at greater cost. Yeah. Yeah. And it's absolutely the truth. Yeah. In in every aspect. Well, the thing that I find to be so strange about all of this is that people are constantly asking government to step in and fix a problem that was caused by government action in the first place. And I I just don't understand the logic of that at all. Yeah. I I just, I'm blown away that people would say, okay, hey, you did this thing and it resulted in this problem. And so what you need to do is fix that problem that you created with the thing that you did before. So do what you need to do. To, what, no, you just you gave them authority to create the problem. Now you're giving them more authority to try and fix the problem, and all they're going to do is create another problem. Yeah. I mean, you have it's to know in advance. It's just a cycle. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was uh, on the topic of solving your problems better than government can. I was. I can't remember if this was on RT or France 24. Um, France 24 became almost exclusively COVID news, and it got boring. Um, that happened with a lot of news organizations. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, so I was watching more RT because they were still actually covering news like that was going on around the world. Stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, but one of these two programs, and this is COVID related, so I can't <laughs> remember which one. Yeah. But, um, one of these two programs was talking about the issues in the UK, and they were uh, they were interviewing this this woman whose father or husband had died. Um, of the coronavirus. Now she said explicitly actually that he died of renal failure. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how that's related to coronavirus, but it was considered a coronavirus. He had coronavirus and died of renal failure. So therefore it is a coronavirus. If somebody has cancer and they get hit by a bus, (laughs) what killed them? Was it the cancer or was it the bus? I know. Well, I mean, if you were listening to the podcast, you heard me talking about this constantly that they're ignoring proximal causes. But, um, at any rate, uh, then she was complaining about how um, the government wasn't providing enough of an emotional support structure for people whose families had been affected by coronavirus. Yeah. I'm like, well, you were just complaining about the fact that the government run healthcare system didn't have the resources to deal with your father or whoever it was. And he ended up dying of coronavirus. And now your complaint is that they're not providing emotional support <laughs> services for the people whose <laughs> You're going right back family to died. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry for this woman's loss, but yeah, absolutely. there's... absolutely, but at the same time, like, you're you're asking for help from the people you're complaining about. Yeah, <laughs> like, this is the problem, I think, is that people don't understand that... People, for some reason, think that nationalizing a resource means that scarcity disappears. Yeah. Um, that suddenly the resource is infinite because the government is running it. <laughs> and my experience suggests that it's actually the opposite. Well, yeah. That the resource hasn't changed any, but now it's run so inefficiently that the actual like pro- uh, product of the resource is even less than it was before. Well, which is the reason that socialism doesn't work. Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the government can't produce enough of whatever the product is. Mm-hmm. Like, they just, there's, they don't have the ability to do that. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many things going on at this point that you're like, if you still believe the thing that you believed when all this got started, I just don't, there's no hope for you. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that I, I hope that we spend some time talking about on Friday is the whole Flynn thing. Like, yeah. if you're still pushing the the Russian interference and collusion thing, then you're not paying any attention was, to what's going on. I was on. fixing to say, you're living in a bubble. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing related specifically to coronavirus, which I hope people have recognized through this, is that those of you that pr- promote central planning of an economy, like, <laughs> look at what has happened here. The government couldn't even centrally plan and effectively administer an abbreviated economy because they shut down, you know, two thirds of it or whatever. That's a good point. Abbreviated economy. Because, Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't, they didn't even have to manage the full thing. All they had to manage was the portions that they shut down, and they couldn't even do that. Yeah. And you ended up with situations where, like, they shut down all the meatpacking plants, but you know what? The cows still need to be, like, yeah. I mean, there was a whole bunch of problems. As I understand it, the, um, the, uh, I guess the beef farmers, what do you call them? I don't know. Anyway, slaughterhouses. I don't know. Uh, well, I was thinking about the actual, the, like the people that own the cows. Oh yeah. Um, you farmers? know, the pastoralists, whatever. Anyway, yeah. um, they, uh, you know, they still have their product. Yeah. Like, but there's a point at which it can't be, can't be saved. Yeah. Um, you know, so they're, what it, it's like the whole it's like the whole rotting in the field kind of thing, right? Same you know? type idea. Yeah. So you you shut down a portion of the economy that um that processes a resource that has a uh, has a limited lifespan. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. And so what happens is the resource just goes to waste. Yeah. Um. I mean, at, so at our local grocery store, at the Fresh Market, they used to have Tuesdays was half off uh, um, ground beef and uh, chicken. Yeah. Right? Not ground chicken, but... But chicken. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, skinless chicken breast. Yeah. Well, they're, they're still offering half off on the skinless chicken breast. They're yeah. not offering half off on the ground beef anymore. And in fact, the cost of ground beef has gone up. <laughs> Dude, it's insane. I've been watching it at the store because, yeah, it's it's crazy how much it's went up. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. There's, uh, I guess that's it. That's, uh, you know, that's mostly the coverage of the... Of, of the convention. Uh, yeah, of the convention. And the other thing was just, like, how do we get the message out there? And, uh, you know, the idea that... This is what I'm, I'm constantly fighting with, and I, I know you agree with me on this, but add as much as you like, yeah. um, is that if you want votes, like even if you want votes, if that's what you're looking for is votes, not converts. Yeah. I want converts. Uh, me too. Right. But, but yeah. um, if you're looking for votes, then if people are dissatisfied with the Republicans and the Democrats and you're trying to take advantage of that, then the way to take advantage of that is not to do like Gary Johnson and say, well, we're kind of like them and we're kind of like them or we're the best of both worlds. I mean, the way Trump got elected is by being different, different. like out and, and Obama too, for that matter. He was seen as being outside the established the, the political bubble, class. Yeah. And um, so to me, if you want people to take the libertarian message to heart to pay attention and to actually consider like what we're about, then you can't go down this middle road and say, well, this is the things that we are like the Republicans. And these are the things that we are like the Democrat or, or to say that, you know, we're the best aspects of the Republicans and the best aspects of the Democrats. What you do is you go out there and say, we're completely different. Yeah. This is, this is a whole nother thing here. Yeah. You want something different? This is the thing. And guess what? This thing is principled. It follows mm-hmm. a certain set of, it follows a code or whatever you want to call it. And yeah. that's, that's what we are. Like, I mean, you know, you will know how we're going to react to things because we follow mm-hmm. a plan. You know? Yeah. Um, and essentially the reaction is you're responsible for your own life. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a complicated plan either, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Like it's pretty Well, a simple. lot of people don't want that anymore. Yeah. I mean, look at the... Um, it's true. I mean, we've strayed so far from where we started as a country. Um, I was uh, thinking about the this whole FISA and uh, court issue that's been going on again. Again. Um, yeah. Because they're trying to renew, again, the uh, Freedom and Patriot Acts and everything that goes with it, including the FISA stuff. Anyway, um, can you imagine if you had taken... had if you were getting to talk to some of the founders of this country and you told them that 250 years from now, 
there's going to be a secret government court that tries people without telling them yeah. and without representation yeah. and that there's no accountability to them, how they would have felt about that. Can yeah. you even imagine? Like, <laughs> I mean, they, were, they would have been like, well, let's pack it in now, guys, because <laughs> yeah. this ain't going to work. We need to try something else. <laughs> I mean, this is literally one of the com early complaints in oh, the Declaration of Independence as to why we were separating from England is these courts that, that yeah. they didn't have any say in and control over and that weren't overseen and were secret and didn't allow defenses and so on. And yeah. we are... We, we can't get our Senate to vote to not allow that. Yeah. I mean, we can't I mean, get our Senate to vote in favor of the Fourth Amendment right now. Um, that they couldn't get enough votes together to turn down the idea that the FBI and other law enforcement agencies can look at your browsing history without a warrant. Well, and it's... And without your knowledge. Exactly. And it all goes back to fear. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's where it all trickles back to you. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a tyrant's best friend is fear. Yeah. Um, and there's so much of it around right now mm -hmm. in, in every way beyond just the virus. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, because this isn't even virus related. This mm -hmm. is in... in this is terror related. Terror related, yeah. yeah. People afraid of terrorists. Yeah. So. Well, um, I, I'm hoping that the virus does more to wake people up to the authoritarian nature of our government at this point. Than it, it does to could. get people to at, clamor for more government regulation. Well, I think that well the the big difference here is that that this affects us directly. Like mm -hmm. all the terrorism stuff, while it affects you somewhat directly, not like this. I mean, yeah. like being locked in your houses and whatnot. Like a, a majority of this country will only put up with that for so long. Yeah. Um, and, and we're a little insulated down here in Alabama because I was never locked in my house. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm considered an essential worker. Me too. But, you know, what is that? Okay. So here's the other thing that the idea of an essential worker uh, implies yeah. is that everybody else is non-essential. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Hmm. Uh, well, I bet I bet those people would disagree with that because yeah. they've got families to feed. <laughs> well, I saw a sign. It's been a month and a half, and I kept meaning, meaning to mention it on the podcast, and I kept forgetting. But now I've got my opportunity once again, and I thought of it right nice. now. Um, I saw a sign, uh, well, six weeks ago or so, that said the only non-essential business is government. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> truer <laughs> words have never been spoken. <laughs> and I was like, God, I got to contact Gary's wife so we can get that on a T-shirt. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we might could put those up at thelibertymike.com for sale. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. could sell some of them. Uh, I'll have to set up a storefront. Yeah. Um, All right. <laughs> but it's not to essential. To go along with so. the, the taxation is theft. and Oh, well, but I can do it from home. Oh, you can do it online. Yeah. Ah, nice. Yeah. Um, hmm. So... I guess that's it. I don't have anything else. We're going to try and do it kind of short. We're under 40 minutes here, but we've done a good bit. I think. And um, filled people in on the Libertarian Convention that they probably, most of them, have little interest in. But look up, I mean, I, I think the only uh, website available right now is uh, joj2020.com. That's the one. I think you sent me a link to that one. I did. Yeah. Um, but there may be a new campaign website coming up soon, or maybe they're just going to uh, incorporate... Yeah, everything into that. That one was actually sure. set up pretty well. I was, um, yeah. I liked the way it it, it operated. Yeah. Um, so. so check out the Libertarian Candidate. Our Joe is better than your Joe, and she hasn't been accused of sexual assault. So, <laughs> yet. Yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, who knows now, you know? <laughs> Anything's possible. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think that she'll be... Uh, I think that she'll be more palatable to most people than either Trump or Biden. Agreed. So check it out. And we'll don't see. get sucked into the whole idea that if you if you are a Republican and you vote for anybody other than the Republican, it's like a vote for the Democrat. That's just a stupid idea. You're not picking a winner. Yeah. Yeah. This <laughs> is not a, a horse candidate. race. Right? Yeah. You, yeah. Um, I, if there's any wasted vote, it's a vote for a candidate that you don't believe in. Agreed. And with that, we'll finally close it out. And we'll close it out like normal um, with two voices. Woohoo. Uh, so as always, um, you know, we appreciate you following everywhere that you can follow and subscribing everywhere that you can subscribe and liking and sharing and telling your friends and get the message out. There. Yeah. Promoting the podcast. 
in whatever way you feel best. Oh, and also, if there's anybody out there that would like to volunteer some time to help out with the Liberty Mike website, I'd really appreciate it because I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so what you've got there right now is me fumbling around. And there's some things that I would like to do with it, and I just can't figure out how to do them. So... Um, if anybody wants to help with that, that would be that would be sweet. That would too. be awesome because I'm no help with that, by the yeah. way. <laughs> um, and I can be contacted at michael at the liberty mike dot com. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, so uh, we'll be back in just a couple of days. This time is the plan. Yep. Um, and uh, it's a short period, but do your best in the meantime to try and stay free. Um, you forget yeah. what you said. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh-huh. And. Gary says, train how you fight. Train how you fight. (laughs) So, ciao. Later.